Hi, I'm Elena. Welcome or welcome back to my channel. And today I want to talk to you about A Room of One's Own by Virginia Woolf. This will be the first feminist text that I discuss for Feminism She Wrote. So if you watch this later, there will be a whole playlist of me reviewing feminist text. I decided to start with A Room of One's Own because it is a reread for me and I really wanted to more actively annotate it. What I will do in this video is give you a summary, my thoughts, and at the end of the video I will give a little bit of a review. Keep in mind when I'm reviewing this that this text was written in 1928, so in some perspects it is a little bit aged. One of the examples in which I found it a little bit aged is that it can be a little bit overly binary, but I will discuss that and we can have a discussion about that as well. For an essay, this is quite long, it's 100 pages long and it has six chapters, so I will go chapter by chapter and tell you a little bit what it is about. So Virginia Woolf has been asked to write something on women and the fiction, and in chapter one she tries to discuss or discover what the question women in fiction is. If you have never read anything by Virginia Woolf, you may have noticed that this is a lot of stream of consciousness, it's what you can find in her fiction as well. So of course Virginia Woolf cannot just keep to one question. When she asks one question you will get a thousand more. Is it women and what they are like? Is it women and the fiction they write? Or is it women and the fiction that is written about them? And she says that all of these questions are mixed together and that you cannot separate them when you try to answer this kind of question. All I could do was to offer you an opinion upon one minor point. A woman must have money and a room of her own if she is to write fiction. That is a quote you can see on the first page and it is something that is integrated throughout the entire essay. What Virginia Woolf does is she has a narrator called Mary. This essay is a very present narrative. It kind of feels like fiction at some parts and Mary goes to Oxbridge, which of course is a fictional combination of Cambridge and Oxford. She goes to this library and we notice that she is not allowed there. She enters a space that is not made for her. One of the first moments in which this is very prevalent is when she talks about women are not allowed to walk on the same path as men are allowed to walk on, which of course is a giant metaphor. It is women are not allowed on the turf they are only allowed the gravel. She says, one could follow Lamp's footsteps. Lamp is a, I think he was mainly a poet, very famous male poet. The male students were able to see what has happened before them. They were able to walk into someone's footsteps and that is something that women miss, which is something we will get back to later in the essay as well. Women were only allowed into these academic libraries when a man of the university would accompany them. So we have this fictional Mary who goes to this university and then she has a lunch there. And the way that the lunch is described is also very clever, a lot of metaphors. Mary describes what is happening at the lunch, but she mainly focuses on the food they get. And she says that documents, everything that is written is always subjective, because the men who write it decide what goes into those works and what doesn't. Writers overall usually don't talk about the food, which of course is a metaphor for the fact that the men don't really notice the things that matter to women when they write about women. Every chapter has a section on money, because the conclusion, one of the biggest conclusions of this essay is that money is incredibly important in the society of 1928. <laughs> so she says that the gold and silver that the men earned that they spent on themselves. So they built their library with their labor for them. When this lunch is finished we get to one of my favorite parts of this essay and that is that Mary is walking the streets and she thinks that she sees a phantom of a woman and she calls this phantom Jane Harrison. She was a scholar and cultural anthropologist who died the year that Virginia Woolf was writing this essay. And because she is a phantom, she again goes back to the fact that women cannot see what came before them. A more elaborate explanation of that reason we get to when Virginia Woolf talks about a fictional sister of Shakespeare. Then Virginia Woolf goes on to discuss the poverty of women and how an entire sex can be impoverished. She talks about how that links to motherhood and that is one of the subjects that is both dated and painfully accurate. So she links motherhood and the inevitability of motherhood in a marriage, because of course there was no birth control. She links that to impoverishment because a woman could not go out and have a job of herself because she had duties within her marriage. This was made more difficult by laws that made everything that the woman owned her husband's property once they got married. So when we get to chapter two, the main question is why was one sex so prosperous 
and the other so poor what effect has poverty on fiction if you have heard me talk about Virginia Woolf before you know that I think one of her weak spots is when she talks about class although I think in this chapter she does as good of a job as she could she talks about men writing about women and here we get a little bit of that female rage she says men who have no apparent qualifications say that they are not women is a qualification they have in writing about women and no one opposes that she also looks at how men write about women and why men are so angry at women why should men with all their power be so angry? She talks about different professors um, claiming the inferiority of women. She wonders why that is and she looks at the rich versus the poor, how the rich are always afraid that the poor will take their money. Are men afraid that women will steal their power? Men focus a lot on their superiority and how to maintain that. She says this is a great quote. By feeling that one has some innate superiority, it may be wealth, it may be rank, a straight nose or the portrait of a grandfather Romney, for there is no end to the pathetic devices of the human imagination over other people. She gets into some historical figures, says that you had Napoleon and Mussolini and that they used the inferiority of women to create their own superiority. And something that I didn't really notice on my first read was that something I'm just going to categorize as capitalism because I think you can translate it into what we now call capitalism. Men are driven by the desire to want things that belong to other people, whether that is land or whether that is goods. So you have war and capitalism that drives inequality. She mentions as well how war drives inequality, but the main focus of this essay is how goods and money drives inequality. Men are driven to make money and more money and more money. The conclusion of this chapter is that to remove the protection men harbor over women and let them be part of daily life, just be part of the workforce. And again, this is a conclusion that I think it has changed over the last hundred years, but not in all societies and not to the degree that would help inequality. So the third chapter is I think a chapter that's most talked about and that is the fictional sister of Shakespeare. Virginia Woolf uses one of England's most successful writers, most famous writers, Shakespeare, and invents him as sister. She raises the question that if Shakespeare had a sister, if that sister could have been just as successful as Shakespeare, if she also had the same talent and skills that he has. When she tries to figure that out, she encounters two problems to begin with. Most women were illiterate. Very little is known about ordinary women and their life at that time. What, in short, did they do from eight in the morning till eight at night, which is is something I read and I read this for the first time I think in 2018 and it sparked something in me, it sparked an interest in me what did women do with their day. So this sister is called Judith. Virginia Woolf's conclusion is that it would be impossible for her to write the way William Shakespeare did. She shares a lot of arguments from different scholars and professors using a lot of arguments that she finds invalid and her argument is actually very logical. Firstly her family or home would stop her from both reading and writing because those were not desirable activities for women and it would make her less attractive to the marriage market. Even if her father was kind and willing it would have made him very very nervous. So first of all she would not have been able to educate herself. She would not have been able to go to a theater and get a practical education because she would have been laughed out of the theater. So Virginia Woolf's very tragic conclusion is any woman born with a great gift in the 16th century would certainly have gone crazed, shot herself or ended her days in some lonely cottage, half witch, half wizard, feared and mocked at. Half witch, half wizard, that sounds pretty amazing. So that kind of ties in in chapter four where the main question is can you make money by your pen and that it would be something that parents would mockingly joke about because that is the worst life you could possibly lead as a woman. Again, we go back to the footsteps, to the library, to being able to use what is written before you, what someone you identify with has written before you and how you use that and incorporate that and learn from that and how you cannot really do that if you cannot identify with the people that have written before you. And she says that most women cannot identify with men. For masterpieces are not single and solitary births. They are the outcome of many years of thinking in common, of thinking by the body of the people, so that the experience of the mass is behind the single voice. That is such a quote to think about. The way that it is used in this essay is very singular. I think you can enlarge it and it has an influence on so many more people than just 
men and women. So we kind of get out of that very dark place and we get to early 19th century where more women started to write. And then we get to the core issue of this essay, which is money and a room of one's own. She said if women wrote, she would have to write in a common sitting room. And then she mentions that women, even though they may have had more freedom, they were often able to write, had a little bit more of education. They did not have any independence to go out in a world on their own. You know, it's always chaperoned. It's always in a company of brothers and fathers others, the knowledge and the education that they had was dependent on what the man, often their father, will bring into the house. Of course, women would write about their own experience, but that was never valued as much as a man's experience, which is how we take certain topics seriously and others we don't. So books about war we take very seriously, books about conversations in a drawing room we do not. And then we get one of the most famous and best quotes. Lock up your libraries if you like, but there is no gate, no lock, no bolt that you can set up on the freedom of my mind. Wow, so powerful. Which of course is referencing the lack of education. Um, and of course not being able to enter the library of Oxbridge. Well, I really enjoyed reading this chapter. I do think that the segregation within the society of 1928 kind of limits the quality of this chapter because it is incredibly binary and I think especially in the last couple of years we have been teaching ourselves to think beyond that. So while Virginia Woolf is really talking about the male and the female, I think we have found a little bit more balance in that, but I still think there is value for the time in which she wrote this. Okay, we get to chapter five and now women have started writing. We are reading things by women, women are writing about women, but what they are writing, they're still an incredibly big censor and Guess what? The censor is the patriarchy. <laughs> and we very much get a trope of women only being written in their relation to men. Women identify themselves too much with what men have said about them, with what men say that they are. And Virginia Woolf uses a really strange metaphor of women having a coin on the back of their head that they cannot see themselves. But men have constantly been telling her what that coin looks like. But you cannot really write about yourself until you are able to see the coin yourself. <laughs> it's a strange metaphor, but it works. A quote I think that is very helpful to use. We kind of know, but we don't really have the words. Suppose, for instance, that men were only represented in literature as the lovers of women and were never the friends of men, soldiers, thinkers, dreamers. How few parts in the place of Shakespeare could be allotted to them. How literature would suffer. So basically she's saying that literature is suffering because women do not stand on their own. And then before we go to the conclusion of the essay, she says, Give her a room of her own and 500 a year. Let her speak her mind and leave out that she now puts in and she will write a better book one of these days. So as a conclusion, I think we are now in Virginia Woolf's current time and she talks about how things like the suffragettes, how opposing to sexism has increased the sexism in men and she compares her own contemporaries with, for example, Shakespeare who used both the male and the female to play around where her contemporaries use it to prove the inferiority of women. She says that a true amazing writer can connect both to female and male side. Again, a little bit outdated, but I understand where she's coming from. She says poetry ought to have a mother as well as a father. And I think if you would translate that to more modern time, is that you should not deny a part of yourself just because society says that it's not fitted for the gender that you identify with. Last but not least, something that I find quite interesting and that I hope we can take away from this is that it's no use to discuss women capabilities but only their situation and the opportunities that they have. Which of course is the conclusion of a room of one's own because if you have a room of your own, if you have the financial abilities, only then are you able to create art. This was a five star for me if I would rate it. I think it is amazingly written. I think it's so amazing how Virginia Woolf decided to write this essay with such a present narrative and she uses all the qualities that you can get from fiction um, when it comes to trying to make a point. She uses that in her essay and I would not call this pure non-fiction because we have a narrator called Mary. I think this essay is honesty at its purest. It is Virginia Woolf not being censored by anyone. This is just her. This essay speaks of such incredible intelligence and being able to research all the things that you want to know. And still she calls herself an uneducated woman because her situation did not allow her to get a formal education, which 
Virginia Woolf is the perfect example of judging someone by their situation, by their ability to have a room of one's own. Virginia Woolf did have those things later in life, luckily, and therefore she was able to write in the way that she did. If you have read this one with Feminism She Wrote, or if you have read A Room of One's Own in general, feel free to leave your thoughts in a comment down below, and I hope that you found this interesting to listen to. <laughs> the next book I will discuss is A Vindication for the Right of Woman by Mary Wollstonecraft, so I will see you in about two months with a review for this one. For now, I hope that you have a lovely, lovely day or evening, and I hope to see you in another video. Doei!